Hi everyone. So in this video, um, we're going to go over experiment 17 called Introduction to Organic Chemistry. And organic chemistry is the study of carbon-based chemistry. So we give some organic examples here. In fact, you can see the reaction here for forming aspirin, which if you took Gen Chem 1 here, you've already done. Now, what we want to do is go over kind of a hodgepodge of what I would call skills that will help you with the organic lab. And the idea here isn't necessarily to master these skills, but it is to become familiar with these skills because when you get to the organic lab, these things are going to come up often. And basically now knowing, uh, seeing them here and kind of integrating them into some other things you've learned in general chemistry will hopefully uh, give you a foundation on which to build uh, new knowledge in organic chemistry and specifically the organic chemistry lab. So that's the goal. Now, um, this is this experiment is essentially broken into a bunch of different parts and Tim and I are going to go over uh, some of those parts now but I do want to let you know you only need a hypothesis and experimental procedure so on and so forth for the last two parts specifically the part on Le Chatelier's principle and the part on liquid liquid extraction so as you watch this video especially on the parts with Le Chatelier's principle and um, liquid liquid extraction please do pay attention to um, th those sections of the video and maybe jot down some notes of what you would like to put into your hypothesis. So in the case of Le Chatelier's principle, adding what will make it dissolve and why, At, um, or make it precipitate and why. In the case of uh, the liquid-liquid extraction, which layer will, will we find of uh, the compounds in? So we'll go over all of that. But before we do, the first three parts of the experiments <coughs> Are truly review. In the first part, we're going to review uh, stoichiometry. In the second part, we are going to review uh, Lewis structures. And in the last part, we're going to, in the third part, we're going to review melting point. Now, when we, um, as we do these uh, sections that are review, I'm not going to go into great detail. So in a second, I'm going to solve a stoichiometry problem that involves this reaction right here. But I'm not going to go through, you know, how to convert from grams to moles and moles to moles and gra moles to grams. Um, I'm just going to do an example, okay? In the Lewis structure part, I'm going to do a couple of examples, but I'm not going to go into great detail. For the stoichiometry part, if you would like more um, information, if you go back to the General Chemistry 1 Lab playlist and you look at um, Experiment 4, there'll be some more details about sto stoichiometry. For the Lewis structure section, if you go back to the Gen Chem 1 playlist and you look at Experiment 11, there's essentially lots of details about how to do Lewis structures. Learning Lewis structures is absolutely essential for organic chemistry. I don't know about every page, but close to every page of an organic chemistry textbook has a Lewis structure on it. So it's really important that you're familiar with Lewis structures. So if, if those are something you're not super familiar with, spend an hour, take some notes, watch that Experiment 11 video, and I think it'll help you out a lot and it'll pay off in the end. Um, so that's basically that. So now, without uh, going into any more details about the overall design of this experiment, um, the first two sections are paperwork. And so we're going to give you some stoichiometry problems and give you some Lewis structure problems. So I do want to go over a stoichiometry problem, which hopefully is enough to refresh your memory so that you are good to go. Um, so here I have um, three molecule, uh, a reaction, sorry. I have salicylic acid reacting with acetic anhydride to form acetyl salicylic acid, commonly referred to as aspirin. If you notice, this OH is replaced by this acetyl group here. Um, actually, not the OH, just the H is replaced by the acetyl group. This makes aspirin a weaker acid than salicylic acid and makes it uh, possible to ingest this molecule. And then we get acetic anhydride. And I have some abbreviations here. I'm going to abbreviate salicylic acid SA, and I'm going to abbreviate um, acetic anhydride AA, and I'm going to abbreviate aspirin ASP, just so I don't have to write out all those words every single time. So in this, uh, in the lab manual, we're told that we start with 1.2 grams of salicylic acid and 3.0 milliliters of acetic anhydride and what we're asked is well how much aspirin can we make well in the case of salicylic acid we want to convert from grams of salicylic acid to moles of salicylic acid 
to moles of aspirin and then to grams of aspirin. And this will tell us how much aspirin we can make with all of our salicylic acid. But we are not going to know if that's how much salicylic, or excuse me, aspirin we're going to make because maybe we can make more with all of our acetic anhydride. So in another way, we ultimately need to find the limiting reagent and the theoretical yield. So we need to do the same thing for acetic anhydride and see which one of these two things runs out first. So in this case, we're given acetic anhydride because it's a liquid in milliliters. So we want to convert from milliliters of acetic anhydride to grams of acetic anhydride. Not impossible, but not a calculation you probably do often. And you're going to use the density to do this. And then it's the same. Moles of acetic anhydride to moles of aspirin and then to grams of our aspirin. So we need to do this calculation twice and figure out which one is going to run out first, said another way, which one gives us less aspirin, and that's the limiting reagent and the theoretical yield. So in this case, starting with 1.2 grams of salicylic acid times, I want to put the molar mass of salicylic acid on the bottom, which I simply looked up on Google, which is 138.12 grams of salicylic acid. On top, one mole of salicylic acid. Now, I want to convert from moles of salicylic acid to moles of aspirin. Always, when you're converting from moles of one thing to moles of another, we use a balanced chemical equation. So, the balanced chemical equation says one salicylic acid gives me one aspirin. These complex organic structures make no difference. All we care about is the stoichiometric coefficient, and there are none written, which means that they're all one. So, one mole of salicylic acid yields one mole of aspirin. Now, we want to know the um, amount of aspirin in grams, not in moles, so we need to convert it to grams. And I looked to get up again the molar mass on Google, and I found that one mole of aspirin is 180.16 grams per mole. When I do all that math, multiply by the top, divide by the bottom, repeat to the end, I get 1.6 grams of aspirin. So what this means is, if I use all the whole 1.2 grams of salicylic acid, I will yield 1.6 grams of aspirin. I now need to repeat this for acetic anhydride and see if I'm going to make more or less. If I make more, the salicylic acid will run out first. If I make less, the acetic anhydride will run out first, then it'll be the limiting reagent. So let's check. Well, in this case, I want to start with 3.0 milliliters of the acetic anhydride. Now I want to convert that to grams of acetic anhydride, and I simply look up on the density on Google, and I find that it's 1.08 grams per milliliter. That means for every one milliliter of acetic anhydride, it has a mass of 1.08 grams of, in this case, acetic anhydride. Now I want to convert it to moles the same way I did before. I want to put the molar mass on the bottom, which for, in the case of acetic anhydride is 102.09 grams of acetic anhydride per one mole of acetic anhydride. Now I want to convert from moles of acetic anhydride to moles of aspirin. Again, use the balanced chemical equation, and as I mentioned before, they're all ones. So one mole of acetic anhydride yields one mole of aspirin. Now you'll notice that the last step, as you've probably seen me do before, is the same. We're going from moles of aspirin to grams of aspirin, moles of aspirin to grams of aspirin. So if it's the same conversion, you can use the same conversion factor. So I'm going to put one mole of aspirin on the bottom, and in this case, 180.16 grams of aspirin on the top. When I do all that math, multiply by the top, divide by the bottom, repeat to the end, I get 5.7 grams of aspirin. What this means is, after I make 1.6 grams of aspirin, which is the answer, I'm going to run out of salicylic acid. So I can't possibly make any more aspirin because I've run out of one of my reagents. So this is the theoretical yield. This salicylic acid is the limiting reagent. And now I have answered both questions um, towards figuring out how much aspirin I'll make and also figuring out what the limiting reagent is. In the next section, I'm going to talk a little bit about uh, Lewis structures.
So in the first section of the video, we looked at um, stoichiometry. In the second section of the lab and the, of this video, we want to look at Lewis structures. And as I mentioned before, if you want a much more detailed um, uh, version of Lewis structures, look at the Experiment 11 video in the Gen Chem 1 lab playlist. All right, that'll help you out a lot. You take some notes through that and you'll be all good to go um, for your Lewis structures. Note that there are tons of Lewis structures in organic chemistry. Learning them is worth your while, okay? And taking this time to learn them now is good because then when you do them in organic, um, it'll be more of a refresher than learning them. Now, I'm going to take this video from the place where you're already pretty familiar with Lewis structures. So we're going to go ahead and look at two examples from the lab manual. In the first example, it asks us to draw the Lewis structure of C5, uh, CH5N. Okay, so we want to draw the Lewis structure of CH5N. And when we do this, um, we want to do the same rules as before, but it tells us that there may be more than one central atom, and it also tells us we want all the formal charges to be zero. So let's take a look at how to do this. Well, the first step of drawing a Lewis structure is we are going to put the, um, or count the valence electrons. So carbon's in 4A, so it has 4, plus 5 times 1, because hydrogen's in 1A, plus 5 from nitrogen, because nitrogen's in 5A, and when we do that, we get 14 electrons. So this molecule um, is going to have 14 electrons. Then normally what we do is we put the loose electronegative atom in the, in the middle, which in this case is carbon. And now I'm going to bond it to my five hydrogens and my one nitrogen. And when you do this, what you're instantly going to see is you have violated the octet rule. Okay, we've put six atoms around carbon, which means carbon has, there's two electrons in each of these bonds, which means that carbon has 12 electrons around it. Carbon's in 2A. You cannot expand its octet. Period 1A and, or period 1 and period 2 elements. Carbon is not in 2A. Carbon is in period 2. And period 1 and period 2 elements cannot have expanded octets. So this isn't going to work. Well, okay, well, maybe this is a weird one where we put nitrogen in the middle. So let's try that. So now I'm going to put nitrogen in the middle and bond it to five hydrogens and a carbon. And we have the exact same problem. Car nitrogen is right next to carbon. So therefore, um, it also is in period two. It also can't expand its octet. So neither of these two Lewis structures are going to be fruitful. So that tells us that likely this molecule has two central atoms. So what I want to do is I want to put carbon and bond it to nitrogen. Okay, like so. And I want to show you two examples of how you might think your way through this. So now I still have five hydrogens. So what I'm going to do is first fill the octet of the carbon by using three of my hydrogens and then fill the octet of the nitrogen by using two of my hydrogens. Now I want to see how many electrons I've used. Remember that there's two in every pair or two in every bond. So two, four, six, eight, 10, 12. I have two additional electrons because I have 14 and I have nitrogen with no octet. So I'm going to put it like that. Okay. Now, there's another way you could do this. So let's say that you chose to do two central atoms for the reasons discussed before, and you decided to fill the octet of nitrogen first, like this, and then go after the carbon. Reasonable decision. Okay, but we gotta figure out which is better. I've again used 12 electrons, two, four, six, eight, 10, 12. I still have two left, so this time I'm gonna put them on carbon. So if I did it the first way, I would end up with this Lewis structure. And if I did it the second way, I would end up with this Lewis structure. In both cases, both carbon and nitrogen have octets. Hydrogen doesn't want an octet. It wants to have two electrons like helium. So either of these seem valid. Well, which is going to tell us which one of these is better? And if you remember, what's going to tell us which one of these is better is formal charges. So let's look at this example first. Carbon is in uh, group 4A, so it wants four valence electrons. It has one, two, three, four. 
has four, wants four. Remember, count the dots as one, count the dashes as one. So if it has four electrons and wants four electrons, it is neutral, has a zero formal charge. Nitrogen wants five valence electrons and has one, two, three, four, five. It is also neutral. So both carbon and nitrogen have formal charges of zero. This is the best Lewis structure, okay? And this molecule is actually called methylamine. Okay, which is famous from the show Breaking Bad. So this is methylamine and is the best Lewis structure of C5, CH5N. Let's see why this one isn't. All right. So calculate the formal charge on carbon. Carbon wants four electrons around it. Count the dots as one, count the dashes as one. It has one, two, three, four, five. Carbon has an extra electron and something with an extra electron has a minus charge. Now let's look at nitrogen. Nitrogen want, is in 5A, so it wants five electrons. Count the dots as one, count the dashes as one. It has one, two, three, four. It's missing an electron. It wants five, it only has four. Something that's missing an electron has a positive formal charge. So in this case, we have a minus formal charge and a positive formal charge. So although we fill, fill the octet rule, we don't have the minimum formal charges. All zero is better than minus and plus, which explains why this is our best Lewis structure of CH5M. Now, the second question the lab manual asks us is simply to calculate the formal charge of this right here. Okay, so the formal charge of hydrogen is always one because it just has one bond. Okay, and no lone pairs. So it wants one, it has one. Count the dots as one, count the dashes as one. What about carbon? Carbon's in 4A. It wants four electrons. How many does it have? One, two, three, four, five. Dots as one, dashes as one. All right, it has an extra electron. It wants four and has one, two, three, four, five. It has an extra electron. Something with an extra electron is a minus charge. If you notice, this is almost the same as over here. Here it's bonded to three hydrogens. Um, here it's bonded to two hydrogens and a nitrogen, but in both cases as a lone pair and three bonds, so it has the exact same formal charge. So the formal charge on carbon here is minus. And this answers the two questions from the lab manual. Recall, remember that this is not meant to be an exhaustive discussion of Lewis structures. If you're not sure how I got any of this stuff or why I calculated the, counted the number of electrons first or how I did that specifically or how I knew that this structure was better than this structure, okay, I strongly recommend you watch that Experiment um, 11 video and that'll help you out a lot. In the lab, we'll give you a few paperwork examples in order to go over um, these Lewis structures. So in the third section of this experiment, we're going to do a melting point. And in the video, you're going to see directly following me talking, you're going to see us do the melting point of aspirin. In the lab, you're actually going to melt benzoic acid. And there's a couple of differences here. The first difference is the melting point of aspirin, I believe, is 137, but quote the video you're going to watch in a second. Um, the melting point of benzoic acid is 122 degrees. So the melting point itself is actually a little bit different. The second thing to consider is that the um, benzoic acid is commercially available. So you're not going to have to get it out of your um, student prepared sample. In the video, we show um, using aspirin from a student prepared sample. I'm not 100% sure which container it's in, but here we're just going to have a bottle of benzoic acid we bought from the company and there um, we're going to melt that. So uh, melting point is a good identification technique um, that's used all the time in the organic lab. It's relatively quick um, and simple to do. So this will just give you another opportunity to practice your melting melting point. A couple things I want to melt, mention about melting point. The first is that a pure sample will have a melting point close to the expected value. An impure sample generally has a lower than expected melting point. So you should get somewhere around 122 degrees, hopefully. Uh, it should be relatively pure coming from the chemical company. The other thing is that the melting point tends to have a relatively narrow range if it's pure. Remember that you're going to measure the melting point from when it starts to melt until when it finishes to mel melting. And we want a relatively narrow range for a pure sample. The last thing is, in order to get your melting point to be accurate, accurate at 122 degrees C, you need to go relatively slow. 
if you go very quickly, the melting point is not going to um, give you a very accurate reading because the temperature that you're seeing on the screen will not be the actual temperature of the metal block inside. And if you go too fast, um, it's just going to melt really fast and you're going to have a hard time seeing it. So now I'm going to turn it over to the video that we did for the melting of aspirin and you're going to do a similar thing for the melting of the um, benzoic acid in this experiment. Once you've collected your final crystals through the filtration method, you'll have your crystals left in a centered glass funnel. The first thing you're going to want to do is get the mass of your crystals so that you can calculate your percent yield. In this video, I'm not going to do that because my percent yield is not particularly important. After you've obtained your percent yield, you're going to want to get a melting point of your pure product to compare to the melting point of your impure product. I'm going to show you how to do that now. The first thing you're going to need is one of these melting point capillary tubes, which can be found near the melting point apparatuses in the lab. Please make sure you're using gloves while you handle these tubes, as the oils from your hand can actually affect the measurement, and you don't want something as simple as that to ruin your experiment. Once you've obtained one of the tubes, you'll find that one end of it is open, while the other end of it is closed. You'll want to take the open end of it, turn it upside down, and just tap it into your product to get some into the tube. Then you'll want to take it and tap it on a hard surface to get the material to the bottom of the tube. If tapping the material on the bottom of the tube doesn't work for you, you can take one of the brushes used to clean your glassware and rub it against the capillary tube until all of your material has made its way to the bottom of the tube. Then you can bring the tube over to the melting point apparatus and get your melting point measurement. This is a melting point apparatus. A melting point apparatus is a very simple instrument which simply heats up very quickly while you wait to see your material melt and become a liquid. To use this melting point apparatus, there are a few things you need to be aware of. First is this red number here, which shows the current temperature of the melting point apparatus. Next to it, you see a little view hole, which when you're using this, you'll look through to be able to see your material. Off to the left here, we have a switch that when held up or held down will cause the temperature of the melting point apparatus to increase rather quickly. And on the right hand side that you can't see on camera is a small opening for you to place your melting point capillary tube. For this video, as you can see, you can't really see through the melting point uh, apparatus's view hole very well. So I'm, I'm going to use my phone as a sort of secondary camera to allow us to magnify that view hole so that you can see it more clearly. When you're performing the experiment, please don't use your camera to do this. Simply use your eye right up against the view hole. As previously explained, you're simply going to take your capillary tube and insert it product end first into the small hole on the side of the apparatus. And as you can see, you can see that product right in the viewer. Please be extremely careful when putting the capillary tube in and taking the capillary tube out of the melting point apparatus as it can easily break, which would clog the machine and make it unusable for any other students. Once it's in, you simply hold up on the switch and as you can see in a second, the temperature reading on the front of the instrument will start to increase rather rapidly. You'll want to stop holding up on the instrument's uh, temperature control about 30 degrees shy because otherwise the instrument will continue to increase in heat far beyond what you want and it'll take longer to cool down for the next group. When doing a melting point measurement, you're going to take two measurements. The first measurement is going to be when you see the very first drop of liquid form. That's the beginning of your melting point range. For the second point on your melting point range, you're going to measure when the entirety of your sample has become a liquid. Those two numbers combined will form your melting point range. Please remember that in our lab, whenever we perform a melting point, we will always measure it as a range instead of a single number. We do this because we can't be exactly precise like some other more sophisticated labs can in determining the exact uh, degree temperature at which our material melts. So all of ours are done as a range. As you could see earlier in the video, I let go of the instrument's temperature control around 85 degrees and it still managed to get all the way up to 115 degrees. Now that it's at 115 degrees and close to where we know it's going to melt, we can use small bursts of energy by holding up on the switch 
to heat the instrument up to the range where our sample will actually melt. So what I'm doing here is just holding it until it starts to heat up again. Then I'm going to release off of it until I see where it starts to slow down. And if it slows down and stops heating below my melting point, I'll have to just simply tap up on it again for a short period of time. As you can see, our material has melted in its entirety. You can no longer see the white solid present in our viewer, and we've completed our measurement. When you're doing this, you'll want to make sure you take those two number measurements we talked about so that you have a measurement to report to your TA. In this section of the experiment, we're going to talk about Le Chatelier's principle. And this is the first section of the um, experiment that needs a hypothesis. So it's a good idea as we're going, Tim and I are going over this, I'm going to show you um, the theoretical part and then he's going to show you what actually happens. Um, but as we're going over this, it's a good idea to think about what you might want to put in your hypothesis. So the first reaction that we're going to do is involving um, methyl violet. And essentially, if we add acid, H plus or H3O plus, to the methyl violet, which I'm going to abbreviate as MV minus aqueous, it's going to be in equilibrium with HMV aqueous. So essentially what's happening is the MV minus is picking up the H plus to form HMV. And in and of itself, this doesn't seem that interesting. But what the reason we're using this particular thing is, as you may not be surprised to learn, methyl violet is purple. Okay, it's called methyl violet because it's violet or purple. And HMV, the protonated form, is yellow. So this is an equilibrium reaction that we can visually um, see what's happening with Le Chatelier's principle. And we're going to do two things. The first thing that Tim is going to do is he's going to add a little bit of HCl. And HCl is a strong acid. So HCl is going to break up into H plus aqueous and Cl minus aqueous. It's a strong acid, so it completely dissociates into H plus and Cl minus. Said another way, we've increased the H plus concentration. Well, the, Le Chatelier's principle tells us that if a reaction is at equilibrium and we do something to disturb that equilibrium, the reaction will shift to maintain equilibrium. So here's from the reaction's perspective, what is going on? The reaction says, hey, there's too much H plus in solution. Why? Because we just added a bunch of H plus in the form of HCl. The reaction says there's too much H plus in solution, and to be at equilibrium, I need less H plus. Well, the reaction only has one way to get rid of H plus, and that one way is to turn it into HMV. So what it's going to do is the reaction is going to shift to the right towards the products to get rid of that excess H plus that we have added. And what we're going to see visually is it's going to turn from purple, where there's a relatively large concentration of MV minus, to yellow, where the concentration is uh, a much higher concentration of HMV. So when this shifts towards the products, we should see it turn from purple to yellow. In the second step, what Tim is going to do is he's going to add Na, so this is kind of step one, and this is step two. He's going to add NaOH aqueous. And when NaOH is added, it again dissociates into Na plus aqueous and OH minus aqueous. Now, at first glance, you might be saying, hey, there's no OH minus in this reaction. So it's not going to do anything. Well, what's actually going to, what's that OH minus going to do? That OH minus is going to react with H plus. And specifically, we're going to have H plus aqueous plus OH minus aqueous in an acid base reaction forms H2O liquid. So essentially, what we're doing is we're decreasing the concentration of H plus by adding OH minus and turning it into water.
when we decrease the concentration of H plus, the reaction says, hey, there's not enough H plus in solution. Well, the reaction only has one way to put more H plus into solution, and that's to dissociate more HMV. So in this case, the reaction shifts to the left towards the reactants. And what we should visually see is it should turn from yellow to purple because we're going to do this first and then we're going to add the NaOH to the already yellow solution. So in step one, essentially what we're going to visually see is it turns yellow. In step two, it's going to turn purple, back to purple, if you will. So this is what we're expecting to see for the HMV. In the re second reaction, which we're not going to show you here, but what you're going to do in the lab is you're going to add MgOH2, magnesium hydroxide, which is only very slightly soluble in water, and it dissociates into Mg2 plus aqueous and 2OH minus aqueous. Okay, and magnesium hydroxide is commonly called milk of magnesia when it's suspended in water. And it very little of it dissolves, so it's kind of a white powdered uh, that's suspended. In this case, you're again going to add acid and base. Based on what you've um, learned about HMV and MV minus and how acid and base affects that equilibrium, think about how acid and base might affect the equilibrium of magnesium hydroxide forming Mg2 plus and 2OH minus. Also note that here, you're not going to have a color change. Here, the change is going to be different. You're going to see a white powder suspended in solution, called a precipitate sometimes, or you're going to see a clear solution. So it's not going to be a color change, but it's going to be shifting from a solid to a clear solution or two aqueous ions. So now I'm going to turn it over to Tim, and Tim is actually going to um, show you what happens when we actually add these things together practically in a test tube. So as Colin said, I'm going to practically show you what it is you're going to do for the methyl violet portion of the Le Chatelier's portion of this experiment. So I have here some test tubes and all the things I need to perform this part of the experiment. In the lab, you'll also have uh, small bottles of methyl violet, as well as hydrochloric acid and sodium hydroxide, both 5 molar. And what you'll want to do is you'll want to just take a little bit of this back to your desk with you, because otherwise everyone's going to be standing around the hood, crowded, trying to get uh, their sodium hydroxide out of the bottles all at once, and there's just no reason for that. So just take a little bit of each back to your desk with you, so that you can uh, use it there. Just be careful when you're doing that because it is, of course, 5 molar HCl and sodium hydroxide, both of which are slightly dangerous chemicals, so you'll want to be careful bringing them back. Now, as for what we're actually going to do in this portion of the experiment, we're going to take this methyl violet, which is uh, in equilibrium with the reaction that Colin showed you on the video, where it's in equilibrium as H plus and MB minus, uh, which is our purple solution here, and HMV, which is a yellow solution. And what we're going to do is we're going to mess with that equilibrium by adding hydrochloric acid and sodium hydroxide, and we should know ahead of time what's going to happen thanks to Le Chatelier's principle. So the first thing I need to do is I need to get my methyl violet in some water. So I'm going to take my test tube here, and I'm going to put some water in it. Now, it doesn't really matter how much water I put in here, so I'm just going to pour a little bit, and that's good. I don't need to measure it. I don't need to see how much it is. It's, you know, a couple fingers worth of water. That's more than enough to see my methyl violet in solution, and that's all I really need for this part of the experiment. So now I'm going to take my methyl violet, and I'm just going to add a couple of drops to my test tube. Just add a few drops. And now I need to shake it in order to mix it up. Now, it's important to not shake a uh, test tube because, of course, there's an open top, and if I shake it, there's a good chance some of that comes splashing out, and I'm going to be pouring some hydrochloric acid and sodium hydroxide in there soon, so I don't want that splashing everywhere. So I'm going to take a stopper, a rubber stopper, make sure it does not have a hole in the top. Some of our rubber stoppers that are in the lab that you used for the magnesium experiment, experiment 12, um, for the ideal gas law, uh, have a hole in the top, we need to make sure that this one doesn't have a hole in the top so nothing can splash out of it. So I'm just going to put that stopper 
on the top, and I'm not going to squeeze it down into it. It doesn't have to be shoved into the test tube in order to prevent liquid from coming out. I'm just going to put it in there, hold it with my finger, and give this a little shake. And just shaking it to make sure I get my methyl violet nice and mixed and dissolved into my water. So there we go. Now we have our solution of methyl violet and water. So I'm going to put that back in the test tube rack because now I'm going to be adding some hydrochloric acid to my test tube and I don't want to be holding it in the air while I do that. So I'm going to get my hydrochloric acid and I'm just going to add a few drops. I don't need to add a ton of hydrochloric acid to observe the effect we want. I'm just going to add a few drops. So what do we expect is going to happen? Well, according to Le Chatelier's principle, we're going to be adding a reactant to this equilibrium. According to the way Colin wrote it before, we had H+, plus, uh, which is um, just H+, plus, in aqueous solution, and MV-, minus, which is this purple uh, that you see here, in equilibrium with HMV, which would be a yellow color. Uh, and so that puts hydrochloric acid on our reactants side of the material, because hydrochloric acid will be adding H plus ions to the solution. So if I add H plus ions to the solution, which in this case are reactant, the reaction should look and say, oh, I've got more reactant, I need to shift to the product side of my equilibrium. So if it's going to shift to the product side of the equilibrium, what we should see is a yellow color. So I'm going to add a few drops of HCl. I'm going to pick it up, put my stopper on it, and even before I start to shake it, you can see our solution has turned yellow. Uh, it looks a little clearer on the uh, video than I'd like, so let me get this paper here. And you can see behind here that it's got a color to it. So that is us displaying that Le Chatelier's principle does in fact work. I added a reactant, an excess of a reactant, to my solution and forced my equilibrium towards the product side of the equilibrium, the HMV, which is a yellow product. But now can I do it the other way? Well, according to Colin from earlier, if I add sodium hydroxide, I can push it back the other way. Sodium hydroxide will add OH- ions to the solution, which will react with our H plus ions in solution in order to form water. Well, by reacting with the H plus ions in solution, it's effectively reducing the amount of one of the reactants in our equilibrium. And if we reduce the amount of reactants in our equilibrium, the reaction, according to Le Chatelier's principle, should look and say, hey, I've lost some of my reactants, I need to make more of those. And since our reactants include MV-, which is purple, we should watch this solution turn purple. So I'm going to carefully take my dropper of sodium hydroxide. I'm going to add some sodium hydroxide. And you can see even before I begin to stir it. Oops, sorry, just getting that back in there. You can see even before I begin to swirl it that it's already starting to turn purple. But if I put my stopper back on and I give it a shake, we are back to the purple solution that we started with in the beginning. That's because Le Chatelier's principle said that adding sodium hydroxide to the solution will reduce the amount of reactants, and Le Chatelier's principle says that if we reduce the amount of reactants in an equilibrium reaction, the equilibrium will shift towards the reactant side of the reaction. So now we've seen that we can visually identify Le Chatelier's principle in action by moving the equilibrium between MV-, the purple solution, and HMV, the yellow solution, back and forth by adding or removing reactant with HCl or NaOH. So you're going to do the same thing in lab, uh, exactly the same thing. Just again, please remember to be careful when you're working with 5 molar sodium hydroxide and 5 molar HCl, as they are dangerous chemicals and we don't want anyone to get hurt. Now, I'm going to turn it back over to Colin, who's going to move us into the next portion of the experiment. So, as Tim just showed you, the MV- uh, um, turned from purple to yellow and was sensitive to the concentration of H+, and therefore the concentration of OH-, which can change the concentration of H+. This makes MV-, methyl violet, a good acid-base indicator. 
So that is that section of the experiment. The last section that we're going to talk about is the liquid liquid extraction section. And the liquid liquid extraction section is again um, a section where you need a hypothesis. So I strongly rec you recommend you jot down some things um, that are going to um, you know be interesting for your hypothesis as you watch this section of the video. So what we're going to do in liquid liquid extraction is take advantage of something called like dissolves like. And technically speaking, this is not the correct best, I guess I should say, it's, it's not incorrect, but it's not the best terminology for this. But I think uh, for your first experience of this, it is um, relating something you know, um, and then extrapolating it to an, a new idea. So I think it's a good way to talk about it when you're first going through it. So like dissolves like tells us that polar and ionic solutes, the thing that dissolves, dissolve in polar solvents and we are going to use in this lab the world's most famous and most abundant um, polar solvent which is h2o water so this is our polar solvent like dissolves like also tells us that non-polar solutes dissolve in non-polar solvents. And in this lab, we are going to use as our non-polar solvent hexane, which is C6H14, which is hexane. Okay, so water's polar because if we were to look at the Lewis structure, there'd be two lone pairs and two, o, uh, two H's. Not all four domains are the same, so it's polar. Hexane contains only carbon and hydrogen, so it is nonpolar. And we are going to mix these two things together inside of a test tube like this. And what we're going to find is the water goes to the bottom of the test tube. And the reason for that is its density is about one gram per milliliter. And the hexane floats on top. And the reason for that is its density is about 0 0.66 grams per milliliter. So because the hexane is less dense, they uh, it is going to float on top of the water. And hexane and water are like oil and water. They'll never mix. So you could shake this test tube up forever, and temporarily it'll look like the hexane and the water will mix, but if you let it sit for a second, they'll separate. Just like, you know, salad dressing, where you have oil and water, you could shake them together forever, they won't mix, or gasoline and water, they're not going to mix. These are immiscible solvents. So what are we going to do? Well, we're going to take two different solutes in the first step. In the first step, we're going to take copper sulfate, and it comes in the form of pentahydrate, which means it has five waters coordinated to it, but we're going to dissolve it in water. And we're going to take I2 in water. We're then going to add some hexane above them. So we're going to have the solute in water, both copper sulfate and iodine, we're going to add hexane and we're going to shake them together. Now, what's going to happen? Well, what's going to happen to the copper sulfate is, where is it going to be? In the water or the hexane? Well, copper sulfate is ionic. How do I know? It contains a metal. So this is ionic. I should spell it like this. Ionic. So it's going to stay in water. And you might ask yourself, well, how are you going to know? Well, we picked a, an ionic compound that happens to be blue. So when we mix the copper sulfate with water, it should, we should remain with a blue aqueous or water layer. Said another way, the bottom layer should be blue because copper sulfate is um, ionic and it has a stronger affinity for the water. What about iodine? Iodine is non polar. And in fact, 
iodine is not very soluble in water to begin with. As we're sitting, as I'm making this video, Tim and I are stirring a beaker of water with iodine in it, and it's been stirring for 20 minutes, and barely any of the iodine dissolves. Why? Because iodine is not a polar solvent, so it's not very soluble in water. So when we shake this in the presence of hexane, that iodine is going to go into the hexane layer. So iodine in water is kind of a brown yellow color. And sometimes, depending on the concentration, it can actually turn color if it goes into the hexane. And you'll see that in a minute. But basically what's going to happen is the brown yellow color that was in the water is now going to jump into the hexane layer. And the hexane layer should be a different color and the water should be perfectly clear. Now you may be saying to yourself, okay, well, this is what we call a liquid-liquid extraction. We have two liquids, and we're extracting a nonpolar solute, iodine, out of water. You may ask yourself, well, what the heck do I care about this for? What is this useful for? Well, imagine you have a situation where somebody gets into a car accident, and for some reason the police expect that they're on cocaine. They could take a blood or a urine sample from the person, which may have cocaine or metabolites of cocaine, and those tend to be nonpolar. So if we took a, if we took a sample um, from that person and it was in water, because blood and urine are aqueous solutions, and we were to extract it with hexane, we could leave all the things we don't want from the blood or the urine sample in the water and draw the uh, compound of interest, in this case cocaine or its metabolites, into the hexane layer, which we can then insert, uh, inject into an instrument and um, identify them. And in fact, this was done up until, I don't know how many years ago, this was a very common way of extracting these molecules out of polar solvents. Nowadays, we use something called solid phase extraction because it's a little bit more efficient, but this still works. And you'll do this regularly in the organic lab. So in the case of copper sulfate and in the case of iodine, we have nothing to change, okay? Nothing can, um, you know, change with the copper sulfate or the iodine. Uh, uh, copper sulfate is going to have an affinity for water and iodine is going to have an aff affinity for hexane. But that's not always true. And that's what we're going to do in the last step where we're going to add EBT minus. This is area chrome black T minus. All right. So we're going to add area chrome black T. As you may not be surprised to learn, it's a black uh, compound. Okay, so we're going to see a black color in whichever layer it's in. And looking at the fact that EBT minus has a negative charge, we now know that it's ionic, right? So this should be having an affinity for water. Said another way, we should see the color, the black color, in the water layer. But how can we change EBT minus into something that is not having an affinity for the water layer? And to do that, we can add acid. Specifically, we add H plus in the form of HCl, as we did in the previous section. And when that H plus reacts with the EBT minus, which is aqueous, we form HEBT. And what we notice about the HEBT is it's no longer charged. And you wouldn't know this, but area chrome black T is a large organic molecule with a negative charge. HEBT is now a large organic molecule. This is mostly nonpolar. So this molecule is actually going to be in the organic layer. So when we add a little bit of acid to this test tube, which contains water and hexane, what we're going to see is that the, um, the colored solution transfers from the water to the hexane. Why? Because EBT minus, which has a strong affinity for water, turns into HEBT, which has a strong affinity for hexane, and will go from kind of a dark colored water to dark colored hexane. How do we get it to go back? Well, if we want to get it to go back, we take the HEBT, which is in the organic layer, and we add NaOH, which is essentially just a source of OH minus. That shouldn't be minus if it's NaOH. And what this does is the OH goes with the 
H to form water, and we end up with EBT minus again, which is going to be in the aqueous layer, so it will shift back into the water, and it's going to have Na plus coordinated to it. I shouldn't have put the Na plus there, and H2O liquid. So in this case, we've now adding a base, shifted it back into EBT minus. Now, when we do this, um, we're actually going to see the, the uh, area chrome black T shift back and forth. It's going to start in the water. We're going to add some acid, and it's going to shift into the hexane. Then we're going to add some base. It's going to turn back into EBT minus, and it's going to shift into the water layer. Now, everything I've said can be summarized into what we call a um, separation scheme. And essentially what we're starting with is EBT minus and water. So we're starting with the aqueous layer. Then what we're going to do is we're going to do two things to kind of disturb what is going on here. The first thing we're going to do is we're going to add an organic solvent. In our particular case, our organic solvent is going to be hexane. So we're going to add another layer where we could possibly um, have the EBT minus. But the EBT minus is negatively charged. It's ionic. It's not going to shift into the organic layer. So how are we going to shift it into the organic layer? We're going to also add HCl. Now we're going to have two layers. We're going to have an aqueous layer or a water layer. And we're going to have an organic layer or a hexane layer. In the aqueous layer, we should have, of course, water. It is the aqueous layer. And any unreacted HCl, because HCl has a much stronger affinity for water than it does for the organic layer, because it can break up into H plus and Cl minus, or because it's a polar solute, however you want to think about it. In the organic layer, though, now we're no longer going to have EBT minus. When we add the acid, we're going to have HEBT, and the dark color is going to transfer from the aqueous layer up into our hexane layer. We are also, of course, going to have an organic layer, our hexane. Now, what can we do to that organic layer to get it to transfer back? Now we can add NaOH. We're again going to have an aqueous layer, which is mostly water. And we're going to have an organic layer, which is hexane. Okay. What's going to, the NaOH going to do? Well, the NaOH is going to react with the HBEBT to form EBT minus. Now we have an ionic compound again. The EBT minus will be in the water layer. So we'll shift the dark color from when it, when it was in the hexane back into the water. And theoretically, we could shift this back and forth as many times as we want by repeatedly adding acid and base. So in this case, our aqueous layer will have EBT minus and water. And our organic layer will just be clear hexane. You'll notice that I've been talking for the past, I don't know, 10 minutes about this liquid-liquid extraction, and I have summarized that in 15-ish words in the separation scheme. So what a separation scheme allows us to do is to concisely convey what is going on with the EBT minus and the HEBT and which layer I'll find it in. What you'll find in organic chemistry class is you write separation schemes almost every reaction. Okay, or almost every um, experiment that you do. So it's a good idea to get a little bit of practice writing the separation schemes here. You're also asked to write separation schemes for copper sulfate and for iodine. They're only one step, um, but I don't want to go over those in the video because then I'll just be giving you the, giving you the answer. So now I'm going to turn it over to Tim, and in the hood, he is going to um, show you what happens with both the iodine and copper sulfate in water, and also with the um, uh, areochrome black tea and the color being transferred back and forth between the two layers. So, welcome back to the practical side of things, where we're going to do a liquid-liquid extraction with two solutions. First, we're going to do this blue solution, which is copper sulfate. And then we're going to do this yellow solution, which I'm going to keep back here for now, which is iodine. In class, you'll have a container of copper sulfate, which may look something similar to this. And you're just going to take some of that and you're going to dissolve it in water. 
which just is pretty simple. You just take a little bit of uh, copper sulfate, just a spatula tip is enough, you don't need more than that. Put it in some water and make sure it turns blue like you can see here. Then you're going to need a test tube, a stopper, again without a hole in it, and your, the rest of your stuff. So, to go with that we're going to need some chemicals in order to check things. First I have my organic solvent, which the label is a little faded, but you can see it's got my 10% hexane and ethyl acetate organic solvent label right on it, um, which is the organic solvent that Colin's been talking about in the video uh, up to this point, and we're going to use that to see if we can extract this copper sulfate into the hexane. So, or yeah, into the hexane. So I'm just going to take my copper sulfate, and I'm just going to pour a little bit into a test tube. Again, just like before, it doesn't really matter how much you put in, just enough to see it. I put in a couple fingertips width, but I'm not going to measure it. I'm not going to get a ruler out and see how much there is. I'm just going to go ahead and put that much in. Now I'm going to take my organic solvent, and I'm going to put a roughly equal amount of organic solvent into the test tube as well. For this, like Colin said, you might see a little bit of mixing as you put it in, but it should separate out pretty quickly. And I'm just going to put in a pipette and a half, two pipettes full, from my bottle of organic solvent. So, we can see that we have two distinct layers. I'm going to use my uh, pipette as a pointer. If you look here, you can see where it swaps from a blue color in the bottom layer to a separate layer, which is clear, up here. So, that will let us see the difference between our two layers. I'm going to use a piece of paper to show you uh, a, the distinction more clearly. So if you look here, you can see a little bit more clearly that we have a blue layer on the bottom, and then there's a pretty distinct line in the middle, and then a clear layer on top. Now I'm going to shake it and see if I get my copper sulfate to go into my, orga my, a my organic layer. So I'm going to close it up, give it a shake, and let it settle. Now you'll see that it initially at first mixes together, which is fine, that's just what happens when you uh, shake a solution of an organic and aqueous layer. Now you can see, as it takes a second, our two layers have reformed. So if I get my piece of paper back out and put it here, you can see that we're back to our two layers, but our blue layer has stayed in the bottom. Our copper sulfate did not extract into the organic layer. So why didn't the copper sulfate extract into the organic layer? Well, like Colin said, copper sulfate is an ionic compound. It breaks up into Cu2+, and SO4-- in solution, and we have ions in solution. Ions, as the name might suggest, are very soluble in ionic solvents, like water. So, again, this is a reflection back to our like dissolves like. We have a polar solvent, which dissolves ionic and polar compounds, and we have hexane, which is nonpolar and will dissolve nonpolar compounds. So since our copper sulfate is ionic, it dissolves in our polar solvent water and not in our nonpolar solvent hexane. So will the same thing be true for iodine? Well, there's one way to find out. I'm going to take my iodine, and in class, your TA will have prepared a solution of iodine, because like Colin mentioned before, iodine takes a little while to get it to dissolve in water, but once it does, you'll get this nice yellow color you can see on the camera. So I'm just going to take a little bit of that, and I'm going to pour it into this test tube. Now, I poured a little bit extra, but it doesn't really matter how much I put in there. Now, it's tough to see in the test tube because it's not very thick, but there is a slight yellow color to my solution. Uh, you'll be able to see it better once you're in lab and the color uh, shows up better to your eyes than it does the camera. Now I'm going to go back to my organic solvent and I'm going to put some into my test tube. Now it's important to notice that I am in the hood while I'm performing this part of the experiment. You'll need to make sure you're also in the hood whenever you're working with the organic solvent in this uh, experiment because the organic solvent is flammable uh, and uh, it has a smell to it, uh, like most organic compounds do, so working in the hood will both help prevent the smell from spreading throughout the room, uh, which most people find unpleasant, and also it will lessen the likelihood that it's exposed to any sort of flames by accident, uh, even though that's pretty unlikely in the lab. So I'm going to take some of my organic solvent, and I'm going to put a dropper 
or two worth of organic solvent into my test tube containing my iodine and water. I'm going to put my stuff down for a second. I'm going to take my test tube, put my stopper in it, pick it up, and give it a shake. Now you can see it's actually separating pretty quickly here. And if I hold this up, you might be able to see it on the camera. It's hard to tell. But as our two layers start to separate, which they're almost done with now, but you'll see that the bottom layer, the water layer, is now totally clear. Why is it totally clear? Well, it's totally clear because the iodine has moved into the organic solvent. Well, why did the iodine move into the organic solvent? Well, iodine, I2, is a nonpolar compound. And while it is very slightly soluble in water, as evidenced by uh, my beaker here with my iodine dissolved in it, uh, it would much rather be dissolved in a nonpolar solvent, like the hexane ethyl acetate mix that we have for our organic solvent in lab. So when I give it the opportunity uh, to choose between being dissolved in uh, water, a polar solvent, or hexane, a nonpolar solvent, it has a much stronger affinity for the nonpolar hexane solvent. So our iodine moves into the nonpolar uh, organic solvent and stays there uh, dissolved rather than in the water. So now we have two examples of compounds that we can move or not move in the case of copper sulfate from one layer to another extracting it into the organic layer. The copper sulfate, our ionic compound, prefers the polar solvent water and iodine, the nonpolar compound, prefers our nonpolar solvent, the hexane. So we're going to do one more thing, which is going to be the area chrome black T portion of the experiment that Colin discussed before. So I'll be right back once I'm set up for that and we can go through moving a uh, substance back and forth between the two layers using liquid liquid extraction techniques. So now I've prepared us to do the final part of the experiment, the reversible liquid liquid extraction of areochrome black tea from one layer to the other. So to do that, I've already got my aerochrome black tea solution in a test tube ready to go. You can see nice and clear on the camera, much easier than some of the other solutions, that it's very purple in the bottom of this test tube while dissolved in water. So the first thing I'm going to do is I'm going to add my organic layer to this test tube. Again, I'm in the hood because I'm using the organic solvent, which is uh, flammable and has a smell to it. So we're just going to do that in the hood to make sure that nothing happens and that we don't have a bad smell throughout our lab. So now I've got my two distinct layers. I've got my organic layer on top and my aqueous layer on the bottom. We can see the purple color in the aqueous layer and the clear color in the organic layer with our pretty clear line in between. So what's gonna happen if I shake it? Will my aerochrome black tea shift from my water layer to my organic layer? Well, there's only one way to find out we shake. You could probably make a guess about whether or not it will based on the earlier parts of the video, but now we're going to give it a minute for our two layers to separate in the test tube, which you might have to wait for uh, during the experiment as well. But you can see as our top layer starts to form and our bottom layer starts to form, that the top layer has remained clear and the bottom layer is colored. It is that nice purple color. So why didn't our area chrome black tea move to the organic layer? Well, currently in solution, it is in the form of EBT minus. So as EBT minus, it is an ionic compound, so it's going to stay in our polar solvent water, and it will not dissolve in the nonpolar solvent hexane. So now we're going to do what Colin talked about before, and we're going to change the form that our EBT is in. I'm going to add hydrochloric acid to my solution. That'll add H plus ions into the solution, which can react with the EBT minus to form HEBT, which is a nonpolar compound. So I'm going to take a pipette with HCl 5 molar in it, and I'm going to add just a few drops to my solution. It's important that you don't add too much, because however much HCl you add now, you're going to need to add an equal and greater amount of NaOH in a minute in order to reverse this. But I've added some HCl, and you notice, if you look on the camera, 
that my layers haven't swapped. I still have a clear uh, organic layer and a purple aqueous layer on the bottom. And that's because I haven't mixed my HCl and given my uh, EBT minus a chance to become HEBT and then mix with the organic layer to stay there. So I'm going to put my stopper on, I'm going to give it a shake, and now we're going to see what happens. So now I've got my EBT, which is now having an opportunity to react with the H plus from the HCl to form HEBT. HEBT is a um, nonpolar compound, so we should expect that the nonpolar compound will be soluble in our nonpolar solvent, the hexane. So you can see it might take it a minute to separate, uh, but as you can see it separating slowly here, you can see that the top layer is very purple and the bottom layer is starting to clear up. So I'm just going to give it another second to separate here uh, because it does take it a minute for the two layers to separate once you add the HCl to it. So you'll just need to be patient in the lab, but you can see on the bottom where the uh, aqueous layer is starting to really separate, it is clear. And I'm just going to put it down for a second while it finishes separating. If I pick it up and I move around with it, it's going to shake, and as it shakes, the layers will mix again, and it won't uh, separate. So what you have there is called, uh, it's actually called an emulsion, where the aqueous and organic layer are mixed together and not separating well. But the important part you can see on the camera already. You can see that in this top layer here, which we know is the hexane layer based on the, excuse me, the density difference between uh, hexane and water, we already know that the top layer must be the hexane layer, and you can see that it's very clearly got purple solution inside of it. The purple solution is our HEBT, which is a nonpolar compound and is therefore soluble in our nonpolar solvent. Meanwhile, on the bottom, you can see as it starts to clear up and separate better, that the bottom layer, our water layer, which you can see right down at the bottom here, is clear because our HEBT is now nonpolar and no longer soluble in the water layer. This middle fuzzy section here, that's our emulsion, and that's kind of what we just have to deal with. Sometimes it's worse than others, and there's not really much you can do to avoid forming an emulsion when you do a liquid-liquid extraction. When you do one in organic chemistry, you'll actually uh, tend to design them in order to reduce the amount of emulsion that appears because as you can see it can take a while for an emulsion to go away when you have an experiment. So in this case we're not going to wait around for it to go away because we can still get the right idea right you can still see that the top layer is turning purple and you can still see that the bottom layer is clear which is all we're really concerned about. So now we're just going to move on to the next step of the experiment where I'm going to add some sodium hydroxide. So sodium hydroxide is going to react with HEBT, specifically the OH minus ions from sodium hydroxide will react with HEBT, uh, and it'll pull the H, the proton, off of the EBT, or off of the HEBT, forming EBT minus. EBT minus is what we started with at the beginning of the experiment, which was soluble in the aqueous layer. So I'm going to take my pipette with sodium hydroxide in it, I'm going to put some of that into my solution, and I'm going to put my stopper back in, and I'm going to give it another shake. Now, again, you'll notice I'm not going crazy shaking it. I'm not pushing my stopper in as hard as I can. I'm just placing it there to prevent anything from splashing out and giving it a little shake. Now I'm going to wait a minute while that uh, separates into our two layers again. Um, and talk about what we should expect to happen. Well, we should expect that when we add NaOH, the OH- will react with the H plus ion, or the H part of the HEBT, and form um, water, while it leaves behind the EBT- minus that we had in the first portion of the experiment. Well, EBT- minus is a ionic uh, compound, and therefore we expect the ionic compound to be soluble in the polar solvent, the water. So you can see on the camera that we're kind of starting to form our two layers, but it's taking a little while because again, there's an emulsion and that's something that is unavoidable when you're doing this. 
one way to help you reduce the amount of emulsion is to reduce the amount of volume of liquid in your test tube. If you use a smaller portion of water with uh, aerochrome black tea dissolved in it and a smaller portion of organic solvent on top, then you reduce the amount of uh, solution in your test tube, which of course would reduce the amount of the solution that can be emulsified. So I used a lot in this uh, video in order to show you uh, clearly on the camera that there are two different layers, um, but that of course led to the problem where we now have this emulsion. So when you do this in the lab, you don't need to have quite so much volume in your test tube. However, even with what I have here, you can see that we have now, again, a purple layer on the bottom and a clear layer on the top. That's because, as I said before, our HEBT and OH- ions from sodium hydroxide reacted to form water and EBT-. The HEBT, which was soluble in the uh, nonpolar organic layer, has now been converted back to EBT-, which is an ionic compound soluble in the polar solvent water. So, that's about everything we have for you today. Uh, we hope that you uh, have enjoyed the video and that you find it helpful for you when you perform the experiment. And we wish you good luck in performing the organic chemistry experiment in lab.